Um, hello, this is Liz from Project Zero, and I'd like to welcome you to our second um, Google Plus Hangout with Paul Salapek, who is joining us from the field. Um, I think I'd like to begin by having um, our participants introduce themselves. We are hoping we're going to have a few other people join us, particularly from India and hopefully an educator from Australia, but we're getting the ball rolling. Um, Dan, would you like to start by telling us who you are and a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, nice to be here with everyone. I'm Dan Kinzer. Uh, I teach at uh, the Chinese International School of Hongzhou. Uh, it's a one-year residential program for grade 9 or year 10 students in mainland China. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's my main responsibility, but also developing um, a walking, a, a learning through walking program that's uh, had some similarities. We've been learning a lot from the Out of Eden Learn uh, project and, and hopefully we'll be able to join in the next go around in the fall. Great, thank you. Natalie? Yes, hi. I'm Natalie Belli. I'm from Marblehead, Massachusetts, USA. And I teach grade 5 language arts and social studies uh, with about 50 students. So I co-teach. Um, I teach other partner teaches math and science in school. And I'm actually getting ready to go to Zambia to um, the rural area of Lusaka to work with about 450 kids and their teachers um, who are just getting access to some internet. And I'm really hoping to be doing some sharing regarding Out of Eden with these teachers and students. Great. Thank you. Vincent? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Vincent Chuan Hao Qian. Uh, I'm originally from Shanghai, and I recently graduated from the Harvard Graduate School of Education. I've been uh, working on the Out of Eden Learn team as a outreach assistant. So. I introduced Out of Eden Learn to this um, school in Shanghai called Chunen School, and they, um, I think, 50 kids have been joining Out of Eden Learn since this um, April. And uh, I'll be sharing with uh, some of the results that we found when I was back during the interview with you guys, and also some of the questions that um, I've gathered from the teachers so far. Okay, I think we will we'll, we'll definitely uh, come back and hear some more from you um, shortly, Vincent. Um, and then, uh, last but by no means least, Paul, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure, absolutely. And it looks like uh, we've got somebody from India coming on. Um, should I wait uh, for them to uh, see if they can log on? Let's see. Bipasa, can you hear us? I, I say go ahead, Paul, and then we'll we'll hope that they can um, join us. And be passed, sir, in case you can hear us, we can't hear you. Oh, there, there. Hi. 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 Okay, actually, as you're there, um, would you, Gary, would you mind um, introducing, um, would you mind introducing yourselves before Paul updates us on um, his, his work? Are we on? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Yeah, could um, Gary, could you just tell us a little bit about your school and who you are and what you've been doing with Out of Eden Learn? Okay, so I'm Gauri Mukhi. Uh, 26 students and I were a part of uh, the pilot project last year. And uh, they are now working in a sort of uh, semi-mentoring capacity with two new groups. I teach English, lat uh, language and literature, to grades 8 to 12. And we, this year we've introduced two new groups with uh, two teachers. Do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi, I'm Rosa. And I do geography. Hi, I'm Vipasha. I do English. Great, great. Well, thanks for joining us. Um, just to so you know, everybody else introduced themselves, but we're now just going to pass it over to Paul for updates before we um, you know, have more of a conversation. Great. Paul. Oh. Okay, we seem to have lost Paul at this point. Paul, can you hear us? Okay, I can see that this Hangout's going to be, you know, nothing going according to plan, but that's okay. We will improvise. Um, so while we're waiting for Paul to reconnect, um, 
Natalie, how about you set the ball rolling by telling us about your plans for Zambia and and actually Dan it would be particularly interesting to see if, see if you've got any um, thoughts on this if, um, mm. as you've got quite a lot of international experience. Mm. Um, yes, um, the, the school in Lusaka, Zambia is called the Mukwashi Trust Primary School. Um, and my girlfriend Laura Manny began this school about seven years ago and it's and it's literally like right in the bush and um, the school though has Zambian teachers that are very very keen on Project Zero um, making thinking visible ideas. Um, they have been getting, they use the teaching for understanding framework and um, they are so excited about learning and so incredibly engaged. Um, but one of the things that actually um, prompted um, some ideas regarding Out of Eden was the um, footstep number four um, with Out of Eden Learn, which is listening to neighbors' stories. Because um, in this area, um, their neighbors or their parents or, or elders, for that matter, the mortality rate is about um, the age of 40 years old, 40, 42, possibly. And what is happening is these stories aren't, aren't being passed down. They're not being saved. Um, and the thought was, with this would be to, to find out these stories of, of their neighbors, of their families, but also to find out to how they are somehow connected to, to heroes and that whole theme of being a hero and, and being important um, and being able to interview these these individuals but to create some narratives. There's there's stories to be able to share with two at the school. Um, my daughter, who just at, uh, graduated from Boston University with an art education um, degree and, and her first year into the master's program, she's going to be coming with me to develop um, some of the art curriculum to tie in the art and leading a, a narrative um, through art as well. Um, and, and one of the things um, that I think is really important for this area is for them to see what, what's outside of their village because even in their neighboring area of, um, of Lusaka and then the whole of Zambia, um, they don't know a whole lot um, outside of their village. Uh, so my dream right now is to really connect uh, these kids and these teachers to Out of Eden um, for a bigger type of global understanding, but also for them to also be able to share their stories. Right. I'm just going to intervene one second to say, um, Shannon, if you're watching from Australia, if you could just quickly set up a, a Gmail account and email us, that would be great. We've been having huge difficulty communicating and we're not managing through Facebook. Um, Paul, you, you well, we lost you and so we, we carried on without you. Um, so, so Natalie, if we just put on hold coming back for some feedback for you. Paul, could you introduce yourself? That would be great. Oh, it me oh, Paul. Paul, Paul. Yeah, well, well, welcome everybody. It's it's great to see everybody here, and, and it's uh, wonderful to be pivoting towards Asia um, because that's where I'm headed next. Uh, I am in currently in Haifa, Israel, about to take a cargo ship to uh, Turkey by Cyprus to begin the next long phase of the. Uh, Eastward through uh, Asia Minor and, and Central Asia towards India. So uh, it's great to see some Indian educators on board. Um, I'm very much forward to interacting with Indian students in the near future. Um, I know that these time time zones are difficult, but they will be getting better. I'm, I'm, I'm pitching slowly towards the time zones, so it'll be more convenient for you. Um, the, the walk has been. Uh, uh, phenomenal so far. We, we just uh, wrapped up our second big story in National Geographic. It's in the current issue that should be hitting newsstands around the world this week about the uh, second major chunk of the walk out of Africa to the Middle East, and that is a walk through uh, Saudi Arabia, the desert of Saudi Arabia. It has quite a bit of history in it, a bit of culture. It has beautiful imagery. Um, of the deserts of Arabia, so your students who are interested in, in all of those topics might find it uh, um, fun. 
So, yeah, right now it's been basically wrapping up writing about the Mendoza and uh, getting logistics set up. I'll be probably buying a mule in Turkey to help uh, carry some of the equipment and uh, bring back the solar power for uh, transmitting stories. So I, welcome, I welcome all of you, uh, Basa, Dan, and Natalie, and Vincent, for coming to us uh, from China. Great. Um, so, so Natalie was just talking about um, you know, this idea of really extending one of our footsteps, particularly the, the one where um, students or young people are invited to interview somebody, typically older, but in this case it's a very specific context. I, I just wondered, um, maybe from India, for example, where we had some fabulous interviews, if any of you want to pitch in... Um, with any of your particular experiences of what it's been like for kids to really try and emulate Paul and listen carefully to people that they might not otherwise talk to or to have conversations that they might not otherwise have. Actually, it's interesting that uh, Natalie has chosen that particular footstep because I do remember the kids really enjoying that one. Also because Bombay is a you know, very cosmopolitan city and we have people from all over India come here. So often those interviews added a lot of value to their lives because you have people from all the states in India. We, you know we have many states in India and different languages. So that was a very fruitful learning experience for the kids. So I do think that footstep was particularly valuable. The one where they interviewed neighbors. Of course some of them ended up interviewing even their grandparents and learned a lot even right. about their regions and why they came to uh, be in Mumbai and you know stuff like that. And also, yeah, and also I suppose it gave them the opportunity to speak to people whom they otherwise they wouldn't have spoken to. Right. Like you know the local chai wala or the bhat wala. So that was quite uh, enlightening for them. And uh, also that we would like to focus more on those aspects, you know, of their neighborhood rather than uh, you know something which is aesthetically pleasing or, you know, uh, which we normally see around in the neighborhoods that they live in. So that was very interesting for them and enriching. Right. Because was, they were sharing earlier how sometimes the students feel that uh, they must, uh, you know, paint a beautiful picture of Mumbai and India because they feel they are ambassadors of the school and our country. But there is an underbelly, and Paul shows us that side too. But I think yeah. that's what we they were sharing that sometimes for the kids it's a little. They want little. to see the other side also. They the want city. to be able to yeah. talk about that too. Mm. So, so sorry, just to follow up on that, you're saying they want to be able to talk about the underside, or they they feel like they shouldn't really. They know they, they feel want like to. they shouldn't, they want but they want, want to. to be. They want they to. Want to. Right. Pasa, how old are your are your students with grade levels? They are between 13 to 17. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. I think by that age, they would definitely have the tools available to to uh, write or record the complex picture of daily life in their in their community. Both, you know, the the struggle even as a journalist of writing for adults is that. Is a practical, nuanced in the story that is not that is not totally bleak or not totally, you know, naively positive. I think the best story is the ones that readers react to. It would be a great, great uh, coup for for young writers such as your students is to combine both elements in their storytelling kit, often in the same story. And I think they would be able to pick up on how powerful that is. Because it, it adds a, a level of of honesty and grit to a story that I think readers, even young readers, pick up on. Really. I wonder if you've got any comments about this point, um, Vincent. Whether you felt like your students were having to paint a good picture of Shanghai, or whether they they felt comfortable, you know, probing a bit deeper and not always showing the glossy side. Um. I think the kids do feel um, torn about um, the bad, the good side and that side they um, they wanted to show, 
Um, right now, the kids, um, their reaction is that they feel empowered by this opportunity to share about more of their personal stories because um, we were at the earlier kids' clubs, um, step four and five, when I did the interview. So we haven't started connecting to the bigger context yet. Um, so it, it would be interesting to see what um, the kids are going to respond in this area later. But um, the kids did say that um, there are things that they um, they they are inspired by the posts they see from other students in the community, and uh, I think uh, it will be um, we'll find out more later in the later steps when we uh, connect to the history and uh, the bigger context. Um, I just want to say, sorry, in parentheses, Shannon from Australia is trying to join us. Shannon, um, you, could you email me with your email so I can add you? Because I can't add you in the current form. Um, or please use the Q&A to add your, your questions. Um, I've also got a really interesting question that um, one of our participating um, teachers, Wendy Youngblood, has, has sent in. Um, Actually, I think it's somewhat relevant, so, so let me add that one in. Uh, Wendy says, hi, Paul. Um, are you able to watch the World Cup while you're there? I find it's a great way to inspire my students um, in, in the US towards international conversations. And she also sends an appreciation of your work in Jerusalem and the videos and interviews, um, um, I guess, through the narrative map. Um, yeah, and she said that then the next run through, they're hoping to incorporate some videos that the students will shoot in their local area too. Um, so there's a few things there. I guess what about the World Cup, Paul? Are you following that? And and what's your thoughts? And and anybody, how we could use some of these international events uh, in any way on out of Eden Learn? I would think yes. I um, yes, I am following it. Uh, having grown up in Mexico, I played soccer as a child, and of course. Uh, uh, I think it's one of the few sort of global forums where the whole world gathers in, in good spirit, right, um, to share this almost common sense of humanity through sport. But uh, the sidewalk cafes in this town that have big screens set up outside, and, and every evening um, when the games uh, are being played, everybody's gathered. Uh, it's a mixed neighborhood. Both, both Palestinian or, or Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis are sitting at these cafes, which is a nice, nice touch. Um, so yeah, and, and in fact, I asked my, my social media editor uh, to find some photographs for us to try to convey this through the project, because on a couple of occasions, walking through some of the most desolate deserts of Arabia, believe it or not, I filmed a soccer ball in the middle of the desert. Uh, it wasn't in great shape, but it had probably been left there by Benjamin nomads. Uh, and, I, and I kicked the ball forward and played soccer with my Saudi and Sudanese walking partners. We even tried to get the camel to join me at one point. So we're looking for those photos, and they'll be posted shortly. Great, great. Um, Gary and and, um, and and colleagues, are, are your students interested in the World Cup? Um, Not sure. Oh, in fact, okay. it's interesting because Earlier in India, cricket was the craze, right? In every street in India, you see children playing cricket. But now, I think uh, oh, there are more really starting up, yeah. Especially this, like our school yeah. students, and it seems yeah. like this uh, yes. this new generation seems really to be more into football than cricket. I see. In fact, today the question that Wendy asked was very similar to one uh, yeah. that our students asked us today. That if you could ask us to celebrate. What? How could we? How we could use you know these kinds of international events to join the world? Yeah. You know, I think those, those are really good ways to be thinking about how to incorporate this this storytelling project into ongoing current events. Mm -hmm. It's one, frankly, that I haven't given enough thought to, like sports. Um, you know, like sports is not a a subject that comes up too often in my reporting, but it should because it's such a part of ordinary daily life. And even reporting the kind of sports that children prefer to play across the world would be an interesting channel of communication, I would think, uh, and learning among students across cultures. So I would actually welcome 
your suggestions from, from your students mm. about how I might do a better job of, of not just recording uh, sports around the world, but even joining in when necessary, mm. uh, and maybe having those kind of uh, small events along the way. Um, that would be a great idea. I'd be willing to do that. I'm open to, to ideas. Mm. In fact, uh, one of the students who uh, studies music had uh, requested that we ask you if you come across if you come across any unusual instruments on your travel, and if you have, if you could post pictures of them. That's another great, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. I'll be, um, you know, I'll write these ideas down because uh, I have. I mean, the walking through. Well, let me just say this. Walking with nomads, with pastoral nomads, um, there are about 25 million to 30 million of them left in the world. Some in India, many in Central Asia, and then probably the largest population set is in Northern Africa and the Sahel. And I've walked so far with Sahelian nomads and also with uh, Iranian nomads. And their main instrument is the most portable one, which is the human voice. They sing. And uh, we are trying to, to post um, audio of uh, almost sort of small ethnographic uh, musicological snippets on the website. There will be more of these. We've got one coming up of an Israeli walking partner singing uh, Hebrew folk songs. And that will be the next one that they've been balanced because we've been, we've been posting Bedouin songs so far. But yeah, I mean, I'm, I can do that. I can, I can be more conscientious. And plus, I also say that if there are individual requests from students, I can't meet all of them. But if you like ideas like this, channel them to me through Liz, and I will honor them. I will, I will find. You know, we've taken thousands of photographs, tens of thousands of photographs. I can find your students a collection of photos of musical instruments along the trail. We'll be happy to package those and send them. And Paul, you had one of your dispatches. Um, it was one of the, the oldest instruments um, that um, it was a beautiful dispatch because you got to hear voice and you also got to hear the instrument as, as well. Um, what was the That's name of that funny. instrument? Do you remember? The Rababa, Natalie. And that, that dispatch, for those of you who, if, you know, if you wanted to go back to look for it, it was a right. dispatch called Stone Music um, that was set in, in Petra, Jordan. And that does has both a photograph of a of a Bedouin man playing it. It is the oldest, I think, of uh, of a of a violin, bowed instrument known. Going back, I think, to the ninth century, eighth and ninth century. Great. When Wendy, who's following along from the US, um, she she's um, added a comment in here. Um, so uh, um, her boys, um, teachers, there, they, they're suggesting maybe the option to hear some of the music that they can then respond to either with stories and artworks, I guess, on Out of Eden Learn, um, which I think is great. Um, I also had um, um, a graduate student who was um, kind of affiliated with the project last semester. And he is a kind of like an independent study was investigating or thinking about how young people on Out of Eden Learn could really use uh, music and stories about music and songs that meant stuff to the, to the students and then to um, a parent or an elder in the community. And using that as an entry point to think about um, connections to history and place. Um, I've kind of got this material that I'm ready to pilot actually because We've heard from a few people that you know a lot of young people are naturally very interested in music, and if we can find it as an entry point to get them listening to other people's stories and thinking about the complexities of culture, um, depending on the age of the students, I think that would be great. Um, so we're going to be making um, some of this this work available on Out of Eden Learn, probably as an optional. Um, activity to start with to see how it goes, but then potentially incorporating it into our learning journey. Yeah. Can I just uh, jump in and say that this actually um, corresponds to what the students in China has responded. They, because they had some difficulty understanding um, the dispatches from Paul, and so they wish that there will be more audio and videos that they can watch to get a sense of um, the journey. And also learn about the places that Paul has been visiting. Mm. 
Right. And that actually, that's a good lead into the issue of translation, which is um, something that we are going to be experimenting with in the fall. Um, to start with, um, one pilot multilingual party, because um, we have been hearing from Vincent's students that it would be really nice for them to have at least some dispatches translated. And I have to say that uh, Vincent took the initiative and tried one um, out with them. And, and also to see what it, would it be like for students to post in the language they feel most comfortable in um, and then us experiment with Google Translate to have uh, young people kind of re in, in, an, in an imperfect translation admittedly but what would be the trade-offs there when kids can really express themselves in their language and, and I wondered Dan if you, I, I don't know whether your students are fluent in English or whether, or whether you have thoughts about how that might work in your context uh, I really like that idea of allowing the students to express themselves in the, the language they're most comfortable speaking in. I think it, you're going to get much more powerful insights. I, most of my students are, are fluent in English, but their first language is another language. And uh, when you move over to their mother tongue, uh, you get yeah, you just get really amazing and you get things that they can't express or articulate. And sometimes because um, and this is why Google Translate so often fails, because one idea expressed in a, in a language, say Chinese, you have a very hard time finding that same idea, that same feeling in another language and therefore another culture. And it's, um, that's a really fascinating concept for students to explore as well. So, so how do you, as if you, it sounds like you've got, an in, you've got an international group of students there, how do you go about accessing different insights that kids are coming up with um, in these different languages? Assuming um, you're not talking about 10 languages. So. Yeah, it's, um, you know, for me, I, I always encourage the students themselves to, um, to, to operate first in the language they're most comfortable in. Uh, and then I also ask them to translate that into usually English, sometimes Chinese, depending on the work, the nature of the work. Um, and depending on my ability to understand the, the Chinese, the complexity of the Chinese. But it's, uh, I, I really enjoy them having to go through that translation process because you watch them struggle to, um, to really get their head around their own ideas and their own perspective uh, because, you know, we often take our own language for granted. And it's, um, it, when, they have to, when they have to work between two languages, it's, I see a lot of learning happening there. Yeah, actually, uh, Gary, uh, sorry, go ahead, Paul. I just think this is a great, great juncture to update all, all, the, all the teachers about um, our efforts to get all of the online text translated into several multiple languages. I'm in negotiations with National Geographic right now to get that done. Um, they, they've translated little pieces and chunks because National Geographic has different language copier editions around the world, as you know. But it's, it's expensive, and we want to have a really high quality translation because some of the work is library. And uh, they also see it as a priority, given that this is a global project whose very nature is international. Um, we want to break it out of the English language and get it translated into at least three or four multiple major languages around the world. So that is in the works. Yeah, I, I, I know. Um um, some of Paul's journalism, particularly the main article from December, that's definitely available free online in French and Spanish. And Vincent, you would found maybe not the full article, but um, a piece on the Chinese edition of National Geographic. Um, so actually, Paul's cover story of um, the, I think the uh, the cover story of National Geographic it's uh, available in Chinese. Great. So, so for those, for anybody listening out there, there are some resources currently available, but obviously um, Paul and, and National Geographic have one effort going on there, and then in the meantime, um, we want to get the ball rolling with Out of Eden Learn in September, and so National Geographic have given us permission to experiment with um, doing some kind of translations of some very popular dispatches with students to try and get the ball rolling just with two or three language groups to start with. So so things are moving. Um, I, um, I think in Mumbai the, the students are very fluent in English. In fact, they're very articulate in English. But 
Um, just on a side note, uh, even in English language medium, we found that it's fascinating for kids who are writing with American conventions to or, or Canadian conventions to interact with students who are obviously very fluent in English, but there are different turns of phrase and idioms, and so even within just keeping it mono monolinguistic with English, I think that's been very enriching for the kids. Um, to, to see that, and as you can tell, um, I've actually converted over to American written English, but um, I myself am quite tuned into British English as well. So, um, yeah, I, I feel like that this is a side of the project that we could, it, we there's more to explore. Um, so I'm looking forward to it. Um, would anybody like to jump in with anything that's particularly um, on their mind, or that they would like to share? Um, I just want to say um, I really look forward to the um, translations if it's, if it's going to be headed by National Geographic because um, when I was in the school, I translated uh, Paul's article on cosmology and also electric choices, um, but mostly I focused on conveying the meaning so that the kids can get a feel of what Paul's reading is about. And we had a discussion about the cosmology piece in class and the kids um, responded very uh, favorably to the way animals are treated um, and that's reflected in the article. They said that um, it's the first time they've seen animal is being treated as a, um, not just an animal, but as a, working as a working partner by human beings. And they saw the detail, details and the attention that the people paid to the um, camels they're working with. So um, I guess if the article was in English, um, the kids won't be able to um, see the the details, and a lot of um, a lot of the meanings will be missed, and uh, there will be less room for them to reflect and learn. Um, so. Yeah. Just on a side note, we've really found um, talking with educators where where students are fluent in English. And, and especially depending on the age of the students, you know, Paul is writing, or Paul, you are writing for an adult audience, and so sometimes the texts themselves are quite rich and, and difficult for kids to unpack. Um, so we found that where teachers have really spent time unpacking um, some of your writing, that the kids have really gotten a lot out of that. So um, as well as experimenting with translating from one language to another, we are going to be experimenting with providing some tools and scaffolding for unpacking um, some of Paul's dispatches um, with um, kind of text boxes that pop out with some contextual information or some vocabulary pieces, and then also using it as a way to have a look at some of the, the moves, if you like, that Paul makes in his journalism, which I will run by Paul to check that we're decoding correctly. Um, just kind of as we're trying to get kids in some way to do on a smaller scale what Paul is doing out on this huge walk, getting them to see how Paul pays attention to very small details or references history or there's evidence of him talking to many different people. We think it might be a nice way to really get kids to look much more closely at Paul's writing and then using that experience and, and to do things with it themselves in their own creative work. So look out for that. That's coming to um, this fall as well. Have you have you narrowed down the choices of what languages you're going to be focusing on for translation? Well, it's going to depend actually on who is going to be in the multilingual pilot group. So we're certainly going to do Chinese, and Vincent's going to help us with that. Um, we're um, I'm actually um, reaching out to the. Um, Turkish Student Association here at Harvard, um, both to um, seek their help with translation, but also to seek their help in recruiting a Turkish school, because um, as, as you all know, Paul is going to be walking through Turkey, and we would love to be able to get a school en route where you can visit as well. So, so we're hoping for Turkish. Um, there'll be English, and then the third language, we're, we're open to whoever wants to experiment with that, um, and possibly Spanish, but, you know, we're, we're going to accommodate somewhat, depending on what school um, wants to participate. Although, hopefully, I would say a major language at this point, just because, I, you know, we want to get bang for our buck and try and, and, and really encourage um, 
a lot of other schools to join. Um, I haven't got a good sense in India, for example, whether it would be uh, how, which language other than English uh, would be best to do. Just because so far our partner schools in India, the the, the kids are more or less fluent in English. So, um, most of the national boards are uh, the medium English. of instruction is English. English. So, but uh, regional, you know, in some of the states, I'm sure Hindi will be appreciated. But by and large, most schools are English speaking schools. Yeah. So, uh, so that's an open question. Yeah, sorry, Gary. You were just wondering when Paul would be able to come to India. That's all. <laughs> well, you, you've got an answer, right? Yeah, it's, it's uh, probably uh, about, um, you know, it really depends on routing through Asia Minor. I'm in the process of, of requesting a visa uh, to walk through Iran. And uh, whether or not I get that visa will determine what time I arrive in India. India is on the agenda regardless. Um, but it could be um, you know, 20 months from now or 24 months from now, roughly, um, if, if all goes we well. We can wait. Absolutely. <laughs> and I, I welcome your, your input about routing. So let me know. Maybe at this point, uh, Dan, would you like to say a little bit about your students' experience with the different National Geographic um, Walker? Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, I took 11 students uh, and a few colleagues uh, uh, with Dr. John Francis, um, also known as Planet Walker, uh, on a week-long walk uh, about, about 100 miles, a little less than 100 miles here in um, Zhejiang province uh, in eastern China, one of the more densely populated provinces um, just south and west of Shanghai. Uh, and that, that walk was amazing. I think uh, one of the things that's so inspiring to me about Paul's journey is, uh, and about Adamid and Learn um, is the perspective taking that's associated with storytelling, both the listening and sharing of stories. Um, and just discovering new perspectives. It's why I'm here in Brazil for the World Cup. Um, just gaining, being in this international environment is always fascinating. And what I realized was with the students on that journey, and also with um, facilitated by Dr. Francis and his uh, his own amazing story and life experiences in so many different parts of the world, um, is that walking really facilitates this perspective taking. Um, so there's a lot you can do in the classroom, and there's a lot of really cool exercises, and I'm a huge fan of, of Project Zero and the visual thinking. Uh, but I'm really interested in how you can take that uh, out into, outside of the classroom, out into the world, because when the students get out of their classroom environment and they're just out in the community and walking um, through so many different landscapes here in China, it was really remarkable to see how their perspective on the world was transformed. Um, for example, I had one student from, he's a Korean student, but he's lived his life in Hong Kong. Uh, and he came with a lot of bias towards, uh, towards the Chinese, mainland Chinese community. And just had a really remarkable uh, experience with very generous and hospitable um, hosts. We stayed in home schools along our journey. And, um, at the end of the journey, he said, I, I never knew that anyone could be so kind to a stranger. Um, let alone, I never guessed that his, his view, his bias and stereotypes towards mainland Chinese, um, it, it really shattered those. And that's just wonderful to see. Uh, so it was, yeah, it was, a, it was a remarkable, a remarkable week. I'd love to hear um, more from, especially from Paul, but also from others who have participated in how the act of walking and getting out into the community has gone with their students. Paul, do you well, want to I, Yeah, I think it's a, it's a, it's a fabulous, uh, obviously it's a core um, element of this whole project is to get out and use your body as an instrument to gather information, but it also it has a, a philosophy and an ethos behind it. By getting out and walking, you, you also make yourself vulnerable. You don't want yourself inside of a vehicle uh, where you can pass by other people quickly without interacting. It forces you to be social. And I think that's, that is a key thing that should be a takeaway for our walking parties, 
kind of on a meta level, even above all the lesson planning, is that by getting kids out and walking through their communities, they interact with the street vendors, they interact with the people who are sweeping the streets, they interact with, with the shopkeepers um, who are standing at their doorways, they interact with business people who might be rushing by with a briefcase. And I make this point to every school that I go visit in person. I always ask, you know, how many of you walked to school today? And in, in that, in that percent percentage, as you might imagine, changes drastically depending on the socioeconomics of every country that I walk through. Um, in parts of Saudi Arabia, none of the children walk to school. They were, they all, because of the, the heat and also because of the affluence, um, motor transport. Generally, they're, they're, you know, they have drivers. Um, so none of those kids were interacting with their immediate environment. It was astonishing. Um, and I think, on the other hand, walking through Africa, and I'm assuming in the large urban centers in India and around the world, children walk to school as a matter of course if the school is nearby. And they have these interactions normally anyway. They're going, you know, they're, they could teach me um, what I'm supposed to be teaching them. And I think this, this part of, as Dan says, being observant, being awake in the world, being awake to the world's possibilities, and then going beyond that, that critical extra step, which is to articulate it, to articulate it somehow, whether it's through writing, whether it's through oral storytelling, whether it's through taking snapshots with your smartphone, that is a fundamental next step for kids to get that to be an integral part of their lives. Get them to be storytellers. Mm. And I'm not saying let's let's find the next great minimalists mm. in the 21st century along the pathway of the walk. I'm talking get them to tell a better story around the dinner table. Get them to think in stories. Because one of my favorite essays, Barry Lopez, says all that holds us together are stories, stories and compassion. And I think that's where the driving under under learning principles of this project. It would make me ecstatic to hear that your students are taking these um, walking clarity principles, these footsteps, and applying them to their lives outside of the classroom. And I think that is the ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. Yes, you said um, there's a few different things that I've been listening to with these conversations that I just wanted to jump in with. Um, this whole the whole idea of perspective taking, um, I think that's just so wonderful. I, I looked back on our the footsteps that we did, um, but just the idea of um, going into um, where you are, Paul. Like for instance, going into one of your photographs that you share on on, on a dispatch, or be and being part of it. Um, some of us as educators, um, and Liz knows this. Um, we were with Shari, and, and you probably watched that hangout, where we were looking at one of the photographs, and we looked at the photograph through the lens of, of the camel, or from the tree, or from the photographer. Um, and I think that's very, very powerful for kids to be able to use um, a thinking routine around looking at multiple perspectives. And I also think the same thing is true when we were just talking about this whole idea of um, walking. Um, and, and who walks, and, and do we walk because of necessity, um, or do we walk to look closely at things or to have conversations with others? But the whole idea of why why we choose to walk, um, and it made me think about a friend of mine who um, she and her kids when they moved here to the United States, and her high school kids um, were going to our school. And they're from they're from the Netherlands, and the kids, the high school students, rode their bike to school. Um, and here in our town, they were they were made fun of um, because they were riding their bikes. And the next day, they went home to their mom, and they said, you know, we cannot ride a bike anymore. Would you would you drive us to school? And the mother was laughing and said, you know, we live so close. You, there's no reason for me to get in the car and and drive you to school. Um, and the kids said, they said, well, then we do not want to go to school here any longer, and can we learn at home? Because um, I, we, will not, we will not have any friends, Mom, if we continue to ride our bikes to school. And I go back to that story that she shared with me so many times um, because it shows me the lack of compassion 
um, that students can have for other students. Um, but it also just shows where sometimes we are in a society when, when we think about what's wealth and what's popular and um, social status and, and the whole idea of perception and how we are perce perceived. Um, and I think that there's value in, in, um, in really unpacking that and not, you know, just unpacking some of the, the sorrows that, that, that happen with some of these kids in different areas or in their culture as well. So I know I just said a whole lot, but <laughs> that was on my mind. <laughs> Amazing story. Okay, this first, yeah. Well, go ahead. No, no, that, I, that's all I was going to say. Oh, okay. Um, so can I just respond through the walking part? Um, I think uh, the kids um, in the kids here, they might not be able to walk to school every day, but um, the part of slowing down and paying more attention to the environment has already been reflected um, in the kids' post. I think one kid said um, there is a post of her waiting for the bus at a bus stop. So she just took a picture of um, the, basically the environment and posted on the community. And other kids responded saying that, I feel like I was there with you in that environment. So there is um, the, uh, definitely the aspect of slowing down and looking closer at what's around you. And uh, in terms of um, looking at things from a different perspective, I think the kids responded very well to how um, how was looking how you are looking at uh, things differently. Um, it's very common that usually here uh, in in China people go travel, they go to a great mountain or go to the beach and take a picture with themselves in the uh, with the scenery in the background, and that's it. So it's like a souvenir of the trip. And when I go there, I am over there, I take a picture of myself, and I, and I leave. But um, less often people are slow down, absorb in the environment, and look closer at the details. So the kids um, said uh, it was nice that uh, they're looking at something who's not just a touristic uh, photo, but instead at the detail. Um, I think um, there's one photo in the dispatch of a knife. Um, I think that's every. Uh, so the kid, uh, one kid, especially mentioned that saying that. So through this knife, they were able to see the culture and uh, I think it's the gear that people carry when they are in the desert. So um, this small object actually reflects the lifestyle and the culture. And they, and they said that they have been looking at details in their own lives. So one girl said that um, I've been paying closer attention to um, the kindness of my classmates around me, to the classmates who did small favors for me. And I haven't noticed that before. So oh, and also, um, it's very, it's, uh, it's very, it was very exciting for me to hear you say that you want to encourage the students to tell their stories. Because I think through um, um, the footsteps that we have done, the kids already feel um, empowered to share their stories. One kid said that, um, I realize what I have to share doesn't have to be something considered special by others. As long as it's something that speaks to me and uh, gives me the jitters, then it's something that I can share about. So um, I think that also gives them a voice and uh, validate the self-validation. You know, they can share. Um, they are. They have things to share about. Um, I have to say goodbye. I've got to go teach. So goodbye, everybody. <laughs> Thanks, Natalie. Okay, Thank Nancy. you. Bye. 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 Um, if I could just, I, I had missed a comment here. I'm, Shannon, I'm, I'm sorry you can't join us on screen, but I'm glad you're joining. And just circling back to things that Paul might notice along the route, um, Shannon is saying food and food production, the different ways that people source, grow, cook, and eat food. Um, she's looking um, at that herself. Um, 
with the, her children at the moment. And um, yeah, I think I've heard that from a few people actually, um, a particular interest in food. And it is something you've touched on actually. And I have to say, I myself have been interested to see some of the meals that you seem to be eating. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing is just this idea of walking and being in the world. Um, I noticed on um, social media for our Read and Walk this week, you would, um, there's been a circling background to Rebecca Solnit's book um, about walking, which I've been um, diving into. And I've also found um, there's actually a bit of a literature about walking as a way of knowing that, that I think is very interesting. And I'm, I'm seeing what I can mine from that um, for our students. Um, but I just wondered if you could maybe speak a bit to what you learned from people like Rebecca Solnit or if Walter Benjamin's writings, people who really used walking in a very serious way as getting to know the world. Well, I mean, I think my, my uh, um, inspirations are, are, are so multiple and so across the board we can spend you know, a week talking about them. It goes from everybody from Basho, um, the poet, um, walking the, the byways of the Far East to um, Bruce Chaplin's work, um, talking about you know, walking through Patagonia. And I think, you know, there's an old tradition, at least in, in, in Western literature, but I think it's actually universal. I'm finding this across cultures of walking and producing art. Whether your art is 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 written word, whether it's prose, whether it's poetry, um, whether it's song, and I, I specifically reference this in, in my in my writing. You know that this is this kind of storytelling is is very old. It's probably the oldest form around. Whether we're talking about West African griots who walk through Mali, plucking at a thumb part, reciting these epic poems um, as they walk from village to village, which is remarkably similar to what the, the Western, the Greek bards did, you know, thousands of years ago, which is very similar to what Muslim uh, pilgrims do. Uh, Muslim scholars in the medieval times recited uh, certain shuras as they walked along to keep them moving. And I think walking and learning and rocking and Telling stories is one of the oldest attributes of, of being really human uh, that's that's around. So, you know, these these kind of conversations, I you know, I feel like are, are completely game for my adult audience. You, as the teachers, have to tell me who that you think your students prepare are prepared to engage on this level. Because I'm delighted by it. I mean, I can talk endlessly about it. Um, I'm fascinated by. It even how the physical act of walking, when you're, when you're walking 40 kilometers a day, what does that do to your sentence structure? When you sit down around a campfire that night, right? This sounds ridiculous, but it's not. I think there is something very, at a very neurological level, with this one-two beat that your body is undertaking all day, this heartbeat, um, very directly impacts the kind of, of work that you produce. And I have noticed a change in my own work. I've said this repeatedly um, since I've started to walk. And I'd be happy to, to, to delve into this as much as teachers wish me to. Uh, and, and Liz, on, on this notion of what these questions that we're getting from teachers about you know, avenues of interest, music and music to musical instruments, food, I wonder if it behooves us to call uh, you know, and I know you've done this already on more kind of a generic level of bigger issues, meta issues. But I'm wondering if there, if we take these suggestions and then just do a kind of a web crawling search through the written dispatches and the imagery to create pods of, of, of information because it, it is scattered throughout there to say, okay, here are 16 storytelling elements, whether it's audio, video, or text about music so far. Mm -hmm. So that if kids ask a teacher and out of even learn, they can, the teacher can refer them to those pods and say, let's grow them, let's build them, and let's see how we can find uh, parallel elements in our own neighborhood. You know, let's go talk to some person who plays music on the street um, and, it, and build our own walking music pod. Or, or let's go and, and let's describe one meal that our grandma made for us mm -hmm. over the weekend um, and compare that to what I'm eating 
with people in villages in Turkey. Um, just so you all know, there is an upcoming food, a foodie dispatch coming up from the West Bank. I spent a wonderful day with some Palestinian women preparing a, a terrific meal that harkens back to Ottoman times. Uh, and we've got great uh, audio and, and, and imagery from that that will be coming up shortly. Great. No, I, I think I think those are great ideas, actually. Um, Pretty and, easy. And, um, what do you think, Dan and um, Gary um, and colleagues, what, do you think that um, bringing in the food would be interesting for students? In fact, uh, the problem I think we as parents face here is nowadays our children also only want to eat fast food and you know McDonald's, now we have McDonald's and Subway. So what was street food for us, which our lot grew up on, uh, the kids just don't enjoy it anymore. So they only want to eat their burgers and their pizzas and fries. So I think, uh, although of course at home most parents I imagine do try to get them to eat uh, you know, traditional yes. Indian home cooked meal, but mm -hmm. that is a problem that we face as parents. Mm -hmm. So I think it would be lovely to, for the kids to rediscover, yes. as you said, you know, something that grandma makes or some traditional family recipes perhaps that can be shared. That would be something, you know, that would be very nice. Yeah, I think it's, it's, you know, libraries are filled with books about this, but I, you know, the Palestinian women who I spent uh, a day with are using food to reclaim memory um, because of the very thing that you're saying. You know, there, there are now Kentucky Fried Chickens in Ramallah in, in Palestine in the West Bank, and, and these women who are parents um, see great value in going out to the markets and, and, and finding the spices that, that have been traded there for centuries and using taste as a vehicle to reclaim memory and therefore of empowerment. Um, in this case, it's also used as a, as a, as a, as a vehicle for cultural um, resistance um, against a uh, difficult relationship with, with Israel. So I think there is even politics that comes with this. Um, all of these things are fascinating to me. And I think uh, children pick up on this. I think it, it can be made cool. I mean, it can be given a mystique that it deserves through the power of storytelling. And I think that's our task as teachers and, and storytellers to do that. I'll also say, Paul, that I see a lot of potential there as we've been talking about engaging maybe uh, more adult learners around the walk and maybe different ways in which Out of Eden Walk might grow. This, this might be a very popular way of engaging exchange of stories from, from adults, it seems to me. There is. Can I just, fact, um, yeah, go ahead, Vincent. Um, can I, um, I think you should go ahead, Paul, because it's something else on a different topic. No, I, I, I was just going to agree with Liz. I think there's, we, there, I have a partner, a, a possible partner, there's a woman in the United States who has a digital cooking website where it's, she basically does a, a global table where she prepares global meals and shares the recipes. And we're working with her to try to get a regular feature, you know, maybe once a month, where we, where I find something, whether it's at a street stall or a family prepares something for me, or I go to a, a, a regional fast food joint, you know, that might serve regional food, and share something that's, that's good and then have her try to replicate it online to share with readers. We're, we're on, we're, that's one of our many partnerships. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, I was going to say that um, the, the teachers, the educators, we have seen a lot of people in China. And uh, they were um, very curious about what are the changes that has happened to you since you started the walk. And uh, um, do you have any message for the kids in China? or? Uh, um, what you, I know it's going to be in 2016, so two more years to go until you're going to be in China. But like thinking about it now, what do you think um, the trip in China is going to be, and what um, any expectations you have for that part of the journey? You know, I, I have an assignment for your students. 
ask yeah. them to help me plan a walking route through China. Okay. Tell them that the plan right now is to come up through through Burma into Yunnan, cross over that border, and then walk north from Yunnan on what used to be the old paper and horse trail of the Silk mm -hmm. Road, you know, the southern branch, along the edge of the Tibetan Plateau through several um, provinces to Beijing, and then walk north from Beijing to the Amur River, which is this extraordinary wildlife resource. One of, the, one of the biggest flyways for wild birds in the world before crossing over and then into Siberia. I would love them to help me map the route based on their knowledge of China, based on what they know. I don't know, probably your, your kids are a mix. They probably aren't. They're probably mostly local. Um, they may not know much about other areas of China, but give, give them that assignment to learn. Uh, you can look on my map and see more or less where the route is. And it's inevitable. It's going to change. But help ask them help Paul find interesting cultural milestones along the way. What, what should he be looking for? Um, and I'm very much looking forward to China. Great. Right. Um, our time's nearly up. There are a few comments that have been popping up that I hadn't um, noticed actually. Um, some are kind of endorsing what was said, but there was one question here from Shannon. Um, well, first to comment in that she's homeschooling um, her boys and um, they feel very privileged to be part of the journey and the idea of embracing slow learning. And I will give a shout out here actually that we have uh, quite a number of students who are being um, homeschooled or who are doing this at home with their parents as an enrichment activity. And I think we have been getting really positive feedback that there are some activities on how to read and learn that really lend themselves to uh, a, a you know informal out of school setting and have kind of deepened conversations in those contexts. And then there's a one very specific question: Have you heard of a book called Mythogeography by Dr. Phil Smith? Which I haven't, but maybe you have. Um, no, I haven't. That's a recommendation. Okay. Um, and I think. Um, that's yeah, yeah, I think that's it. And anybody, as our time is up, anybody want to, um, any last comments, um, things that people uh, would like to say before we go our separate ways? I think our students had a lot of questions. So what yeah. we'll do is we'll just mail them yeah, to you. Yeah. And then you can forward, forward them to forward. Yes. That was, yeah. yeah. And the there second thing is, of course, it's been an absolute honor to have it be able to meet you like this. Yeah. And we do hope our students will get the opportunity yeah. to speak to you. Because yeah. wildly in this. <laughs> I look forward to that tremendously. Very excited about it. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, I'll be in touch with um, you all, but um, thank you very much for participating. I'm sorry we weren't able to get Shruti, um, um, who's now in Bangalore, or um, Shannon from Australia, but another time. Um, thank you very much, Paul, for your time, and um, yeah, look forward to staying in touch. All right, thank you, everybody. Let's do keep in touch. Thank all right. you. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.